two, one. I call this hearing of the Subcommittee on Rural Development and Energy to order, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today um, in person as well as virtually. This hearing will be in a hybrid format. Witnesses will be appearing virtually, and senators will be appearing both in person and virtually. So first, I want to thank Senator Ernst for working with me on today's bipartisan hearing focusing on renewable energy and for our strong partnership on issues that shape the lives of people living in rural America, including economic development. I look forward to having Senator Ernst as a partner on this subcommittee, this Congress, as we explore a number of important rural development issues. Senator Ernst and I have worked together on issues to support rural farming communities, like increasing access to conservation programs, creating more transparency in the cattle markets, and helping hog farmers hit hard by the pandemic. And we will continue our working relationship on this subcommittee to highlight the great strengths of rural communities and the lessons that we can learn from leaders on the ground about how the federal government can be a good and a better partner. I start from the perspective that small towns and rural places are entrepreneurial, diverse, wonderful places to work and live and raise a family. They produce our food and our energy. They are hubs of manufacturing, small business, education, healthcare, arts, and culture. When I travel to rural communities across Minnesota, I find hardworking, passionate people who love their communities and are focused on making them even better. So my hope for this subcommittee is to highlight these contributions. The Rural Development and Energy Subcommittee should lift up and promote the local ideas that are helping communities thrive. And some of the best opportunities and best ideas for building a strong rural economy are in clean energy. Renewable energy is rural energy. The clean energy transition is the cornerstone to building and sustaining economic vitality in rural communities. Renewable energy programs are already sparking economic growth across Minnesota and across the country. Professor Shaobo Deng at the University of Minnesota Southern Research and Outreach Center in Waseca, Minnesota, for example, is partnering with Minnesota soybean growers to develop and promote a new plasma technology that has the potential to drastically reduce the energy consumption and cost of biodiesel production. His research is showing how we can use renewable wind and solar electricity to produce biofuels with a strikingly low carbon impact. Biodiesel and ethanol are low carbon fuels and they get greener every year and become a more economic and viable alternative to fossil fuels. If we add carbon capture and storage facilities to our biodiesel production facilities, as is proposed in Iowa and Minnesota, we can drive the carbon footprint down even further and create more opportunity in rural America. Cars and light trucks fueled by homegrown renewable energy or, and electricity and biofuels will literally drive the emission reductions that we need in the transportation sector. And this is why we need a national low carbon fuel standard. And as we need to continue supporting the R&D to develop biofuels as well for ships and airplanes and long distance trucking, sectors that won't likely be electrified anytime soon. We need new clean programs, but we also need to get more from our existing efforts. The energy title of the Farm Bill incentivizes farmers to install renewable energy systems on their farms. This week, I'll be introducing legislation to improve and increase funding for the REAP program, which is the flagship of the energy title. Programs like REAP should be in the climate and infrastructure package that we must pass this summer. Rural America will benefit tremendously if we pass an investment also in a clean-based, clean electricity standard as part of that same package. These strategies are all about creating jobs and economic opportunity in rural places. And it takes a skilled workforce to install these renewable energy systems. And it takes training that workforce at local technical colleges to ensure that those farmers can hire their neighbors to do the work. So today we are joined by a panel of witnesses who will share their thoughts on how renewable energy can spur economic growth in rural areas. And today's testimony will inform all of us on this uh, subcommittee as we work to draft bipartisan infrastructure bills and as we consider climate resilient legislation. It's important that rural voices are included in this policy discussion that comes before the Senate and this includes fostering renewable energies as a rural development economic driver. 
So it's been a pleasure to work with Senator Ernst in planning this hearing, and I will now turn to her for any opening comments that she'd like to make this morning. Thank you, Chairwoman Smith, and I am pleased to join you this morning for this hearing of the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Subcommittee on Rural Development and Energy. Since the early 1900s, the federal government has administered various programs aiding communities in rural America. Today, the major agency tasked with carrying out the bulk of these programs is USDA's Office of Rural Development. Created under the 1990 Farm Bill, Rural Development's main function is administering grants, loans, and loan guarantees to support a number of services in rural communities, including the construction and maintenance of telecommunications infrastructure, rural business development and retention, water and wastewater treatment facilities, and rural housing. USDA Rural Development is also tasked with administering programs that support energy production, particularly renewable energy production throughout farm country. These programs have worked to support additional markets for our nation's corn and soybean producers by funding the construction of advanced biofuels facilities. They assist rural businesses and farmers looking to expand renewable energy production or implement energy efficiency measures. And these programs help finance and the generation and distribution of reliable baseload electricity to power our rural communities. Considering my upbringing in rural America and the critical role that Iowa plays in producing energy for the nation, I am privileged to serve as ranking member of this subcommittee. Today, over half of Iowa's three million residents live in rural communities. Each year I travel Iowa and do a tour of each of the state's 99 counties and 75 of them have a population of under 25,000. Needless to say, strong rural economies are essential to a strong Iowa. In Iowa, our fertile soil and ideal growing conditions have empowered us to lead the country in the production of pork, corn, and soybeans. We are also a national leader in renewable energy production. Iowa is proud to be the top ethanol and biodiesel producer in the country and the second largest producer of wind energy. Iowa is also making significant strides in the production of solar energy and in doing so in a way that ensures our rural communities will continue to have access to reliable, affordable electricity. Iowa is also home to leading academic institutions offering programs to Iowans and students across the country looking to pursue careers in the installation and maintenance of renewable energy systems. As we begin preliminary discussions about the 2023 Farm Bill, it is important we look at programs under our subcommittee's jurisdiction to determine what is working and what may need improvement. We must continue exploring improvements in our programs to drive economic growth throughout rural America, and that is why today's hearing is so timely and important. Thank you again, Chairwoman Smith, for working with me to hold this hearing. I look forward to the testimony from our distinguished panel of witnesses. I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Ernst. Um, we are now going to introduce our witnesses. I will introduce the first three, and then Senator Ernst will introduce the next two. Um, and then we will turn to each of the witnesses to make their opening statements. I'd like to start with Mr. Shannon Schlecht, who is Executive Director of the Agriculture Utilization and Research Institute. Mr. Schlecht is responsible for the overall strategic and operational oversight of this organization's staff and programs and, exec and also the execution of its mission. Mr. Schlecht most recently served as the Vice President of Policy for U.S. Sweet Associates and has held numerous roles within the Trade Association during his 14 years with the organization. And he has extensive background in agriculture policy, market development, international trade, strategic planning, and management. Mr. Schleck will, will speak today about the importance of research and development to the rural clean energy and bioeconomy revolution. Thank you for being here today, Shannon. 
The Honorable Chair Katie Sieben was appointed as Commissioner of the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission in 2017 and in 2019 was appointed to the chair, was appointed as chair by Governor Tim Walls. Chair Sieben is an active member of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners and is the Vice President of the Mid-America Regulatory Conference and is chair of the Nuclear Waste Strategy Coalition. Chair Sieben previously served in the Minnesota legislature for 14 years and was the assistant majority leader of the state Senate. I invited Chair Sieben to speak today because she can speak best to a Minnesota model for ensuring that rural renewable energy benefits workers and their communities. So thank you for being with us today, Chair Sieben. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Emily Score. She is a St. Paul native. Uh, she joined Growth Energy as CEO in May of 2016. And prior to joining Growth Energy, Emily served as Vice President of Communications for the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. At the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, Ms. Score led the industry's public affairs, strategic communications, and marketing. And she's also served as Senior Vice President at a nationally recognized crisis management firm, where she led communications campaign for Fortune 100 companies and industry trade groups. Ms. Score graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Wellesley College, and she lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and two children. Thank you for being here today with us, Emily. And now I recognize Senator Ernst, who will make our final two introductions. Thank you, Chairwoman Smith. Uh, today, I am pleased to welcome our two Iowa witnesses. First is Mr. Bill Cherrier, the Executive Vice President and CEO of Central Iowa Power Cooperative, or SIPCO. With 40 years of experience in the utility industry, Bill joined SIPCO in 2017 in the role he holds today. Prior to SIPCO, Bill served as Chief Planning and Finance Officer for Colorado Springs Utilities, but got his start in the energy space at IES Industries and Alliant Energy Generation, both located in Cedar Rapids. While at SIPCO, Bill has overseen a changing power generation landscape, which has included adding efficient natural gas, wind, and solar to SIPCO's energy portfolio. Bill earned his bachelor's degree in accounting from Loris College in Dubuque, and he is, certified, he is a certified public accountant. Bill currently lives in West Des Moines with Mary, his wife of 25 years, and he has three grown children and one grandchild, Mason. Bill, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Our next witness is the Dean of Industrial Technology at Iowa Western, Mr. Matt Mancuso. Matt first joined Iowa Western in 2010 and has held a number of roles, including sustainability coordinator and director of corporate training. In 2015, Matt transitioned to academic affairs, where he now serves as the Dean of Industrial Technology. Consisting of 16 academic programs, the Department of Industrial Technology is helping train Iowans and other students from across the country to pursue jobs in renewable industries, including the installation, maintenance, and repair of wind and solar energy systems. Matt holds a Master of Science in Urban Policy Analysis and Management and a bachelor's degree from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Matt, thank you for joining us today. And with that, to Madam Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Senator Ernst. And again, I thank all of our witnesses for being with us today. And as a reminder, we ask that you keep your testimony to about five minutes each. And you may hear me tap the gavel um, should your time expire. And we will start with Mr. Schlecht. You are recognized for five minutes. Very good, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you today about renewable energy and AURI's role in supporting the industry in Minnesota and surrounding states. My name is Shannon Schlecht. I am the Executive Director of the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. I've been with the organization for over five years now, and I'm constantly amazed at the ideation and innovative spirit in the egg and food industry, especially in the state's rural areas. The Minnesota legislature created AURI in the late 1980s during the farm crisis. And for over 30 years, AURI has worked with producers, entrepreneurs, cooperatives, small and large egg and food businesses to accelerate their ideas of new value added opportunities and to bring those into the commercial market to benefit the egg and food industry. AURI's role is as a trusted advisor. 
We provide business and technical assistance to commercialize ideas. We launch commercial um, public awareness initiative ideas around new opportunities. We convene and connect industry to accelerate new ideas. And we provide access to laboratories, a resource that does not often exist in rural areas. I'm proud to say that our work to develop and de-risk opportunities has been reported by our clients to generate over 320 million in new egg and food sales each year, much of which benefits rural, rural economies. ARI focuses on four areas, bio-based products, renewable energy, food, and co-products. All of these areas undoubtedly have a positive impact on rural economies, but bio, biofuels production has undoubtedly had an outsized impact over the last couple of decades. ARI plays a key role in advancing the state's innovative philosophy around renewable energy. We have conducted a, a renewable energy roundtable since 2006 to position Minnesota as a national leader in the space. We use this framework to generate awareness around new ideas and opportunities in the renewable energy space. And in 2008, the state legislature even incorporated this framework into ARI's founding statute. Biofuels companies we know are constantly exploring new innovations and looking for additional uses for their products. One cooperative has even taken a look back using grain fermentation uh, to bring the alcohols back to the marketplace, while others are exploring bio-based chemicals, higher protein DDGs, fiber and, and starch separation technologies, just to name a few. Regarding ethanol, ARI named Chippewa Valley Ethanol Company as its Egg Innovator of the Year in 2017. This cooperative has continually displayed a culture of innovation. In addition to ethanol, it produces alcohol for food and beverage uses, pharmaceuticals, and industrial uses. We even worked with them on a gasification system to reduce their reliance on natural gas in the ethanol process. ARI has provided technical assistance as well to bio biodiesel producers for many years. We work with them not just on the technical aspects of biodiesel, but on valuation of whole products such as glycerin and turning those ideas into new market opportunities. Our work in partnerships across the renewable energy space is diverse and forward looking. ARI currently sits on the board of an innovation campus concept for Crookston, Minnesota that will include a small oil seed crush, laboratories, and ultimately serve as an incubation site to spur new innovations focused on oil seeds and agricultural products, including renewable energy. Our mandate to utilize agricultural products in our innovative philosophy also has led to new leadership roles in recent years. For example, we recently created an industry collaboration to explore advancing a renewable natural gas industry in Minnesota. One project concept is to quantify the volume, location, and value of various organic feedstocks, along with existing infrastructure, to help de-risk and move the investment forward for new anaerobic digestion, digester systems. Many farmers tell us that they do not have the expertise or the time to advance these types of concepts on their own, but would be willing to participate in them. Another area that we have partnered with the University of Minnesota is around potential uses for cash cover crops and perennial crops that can both improve soil health as well as meat market needs. Our role is to identify commercial opportunities around items such as renewable fuels and then work with the value chain participants to, tell, to bring these ideas to the marketplace. Regarding the use of renewable biomass, we have worked with the University of Minnesota to better understand the holistic advantages of using biomass in heating systems for poultry barns. And on the flip side, we've looked at using biomass to even cool buildings and looking at innovative cooling systems using biomass for commercial and industrial facilities. We are also taking a collaborative approach to better understand how disruptive technologies like green ammonia and hydrogen can be an opportunity or a threat for the biofuels or agricultural industry. Asking questions such as, what synergies exist with our biofuels producers? Is this an opportunity for a lower carbon biofuel production? And can farmers benefit or have another farmer owned business opportunity? Providing federal resources to help address challenges and opportunities in our new innovations will be key to the success. And we appreciate your leadership and your forward looking efforts around renewable energy and rural economies and the important role of agriculture and innovation. Thank you for the time and opportunity to share perspectives today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. We'll now turn to Chair Sieben, who is recognized for five minutes. Chair Smith, Ranking Member Ernst, and members of the subcommittee, good morning. I'm Katie Sieben, and it's an honor to testify today on behalf of the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. The commission regulates our state's electric and natural gas providers, 
and our mission is to create a regulatory structure that ensures reliable utility services at fair, reasonable rates that are consistent with Minnesota's telecommunications and energy policies. We are economic regulators primarily, but increasingly we are seeing and measuring the impact of clean energy and its transition on Greater Minnesota. Today I'd like to share several points about the importance of ensuring the benefits of clean energy reach rural communities and offer some insights into how we as regulators have played a role in this. First and importantly, low prices for electricity and natural gas are critically important for economic growth, whether that's in Fergus Falls, Hastings, or Mankato. We work hard to ensure a robust participatory permitting process so that developers and utilities can build needed generation to deliver reliable power. As older generators reach the end of their useful lives, and utilities either set their own emissions goals or are directed to by policymakers, new renewable energy is taking its place. In 2020, Minnesota built 588 megawatts of new generation capacity, and all of it was renewable and all was located in rural communities. The financial upside of this new generation is significant. Since 2004, wind energy production tax has generated over $133 million in revenue for Minnesota counties. There are counties in southern Minnesota that receive more than a quarter of their yearly budget in wind production tax revenues. There are also, of course, tens of millions of dollars of payments to landowners, many of whom are farmers, that invest these payments in local communities. Job creation is a critical component of the benefits of new generation. When the Commission began asking developers to report on the number of jobs created in large wind and solar construction projects, it signaled to the industry that the socioeconomic benefits of these expensive projects should flow to local workers, their families, and rural communities. Since we began reporting on the use of local labor, defined as people who live within 150 miles of a project, we've seen a significant shift in the percentage of local hires local workers hired, from 20 to upwards of 70%. This has resulted in a better trained workforce in many areas of the state and has encouraged the development of worker training programs that lead to new job pathways. When the COVID pandemic hit last year, it led to a dramatic loss of clean energy jobs across the Minnesota and an estimated loss of 11,000 clean energy jobs in Minnesota alone. The Commission, knowing that the energy sector represents one-sixth of our state's economy, understood it needed a boost. So the Commission requested the acceleration of investments in clean energy projects, and utilities responded. Here are two examples. Excel Energy is in the process of repowering six wind projects across greater Minnesota. It will result in over 800 jobs, annual property tax revenue of roughly $4 million, and annual landowner payments of $6 million per year, all while saving ratepayers an estimated $160 million. Second, the Duluth, Laskin, and Sylvan solar projects were approved for Minnesota Power. The company is building three solar facilities, totaling 21 megawatts of capacity, using highly skilled labor, contracting with minority-owned businesses, and using locally manufactured solar panels. Importantly, there was robust community support for these three solar projects. Finally, I want to emphasize that transmission investments are needed, desperately, across the Midwest and throughout the country. New transmission can maximize the value of low-cost renewable energy and create living wage jobs that are essential to ensuring Americans have reliable power. Please include transmission investments in the American Jobs Plan or other relevant legislation. Thank you for your time today and your leadership in supporting our rural communities as our energy systems are transforming. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Chair Sieben. I will now turn to Ms. Score, who was recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Smith, Ranking Member Ernst, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to speak to you today about biofuels' vital role in addressing climate change and driving our rural economy. My name is Emily Score. I am the CEO of Growth Energy, our nation's largest ethanol trade association. We represent over half of all U.S. ethanol production, 
including 92 producer plants and 91 innovative businesses that support biofuel production. 210 biorefineries across 27 states have the capacity to produce more than 17 billion gallons of ethanol, a low carbon renewable liquid fuel. We are the second largest customer for U.S. corn growers, using roughly one third of the corn crop to produce ethanol and co-products such as high protein animal feed and corn oil. Biofuels like ethanol are critical to meeting carbon reduction goals today and well into the future. In fact, studies show there is no path to net zero emissions by 2050 without biofuels. EIA projects the gasoline or flex, that gasoline or flex fuel powered vehicles will make up about 80% of new vehicle sales in 2050, meaning the vast majority of the cars on the road will continue to be powered by liquid fuels for decades to come. We know there is no one size fits all path toward decarbonization, which is why biofuels remain essential in any effective transition away from fossil fuels. The environmental benefits are clear. Ethanol today reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 46% compared to traditional gasoline. Moving our nation's standard fuel from E10 to E15, a 15% ethanol blend, will deliver substantial greenhouse gas emission reductions, the equivalent of removing nearly 4 million vehicles from the road each year. The economic benefits of increased biofuel use are also clear. Our industry supports over 300,000 American jobs, many based in rural communities. Today, Growth Energy is releasing a new study which shows that a nationwide move to E15 will add 17.8 billion to US GDP, support more than 182,000 additional jobs, generate 10.5 billion in new household income, and save consumers 12.2 billion in fuel costs. To capture these benefits, expanding market access to higher ethanol fuel blends is our top priority. E15 is currently sold at nearly 2,500 sites in 30 states across the nation. We expand that exponentially by making long-term infrastructure incentives available to fuel retailers. The BIP and HBIP programs administered under Secretaries Vilsack and Purdue significantly expanded markets for higher ethanol blends. Any infrastructure package considered by Congress should build upon these successes to further promote investment in low carbon biofuels. We strongly support efforts by those on this subcommittee to provide such incentives for E15 and higher blends, particularly Senators Klobuchar and Ernst's Renewable Fuel Infrastructure Investment and Market Expansion Act. Growing the share of renewable biofuels in America's fuel supply is crucial to achieving net zero emissions and promoting high paying clean energy jobs in rural America. To do this, we must have a strong RFS. A recent news report stated that the administration is contemplating RFS relief for refineries that refuse to blend biofuels. Not only would this undercut the growth of homegrown renewable energy, it would also backtrack on explicit promises President Biden made when he was a candidate. In 2019, President Biden said in Iowa, and I quote, those waivers are a gigantic mistake. We should not be exempting, we should be insisting that these major oil companies meet the criteria that is set, end quote. We wholeheartedly agree that refiners should meet their blending obligations. Lowering, waiving, capping, or any backtracking on the promise of the RFS damages our ability to decarbonize our vehicle fleet, threatens large agricultural markets, and jeopardizes hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs supported by the biofuel industry. Lastly, thank you for your tireless efforts in securing COVID relief for our producers through the USDA. This was welcomed news after weathering the most difficult year the industry has ever seen. As we await further direction on how funds will be distributed, we remain grateful for your advocacy efforts. To close, biofuels ensure that we achieve our nation's climate goals and strengthen our rural economy. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much. We now turn to Mr. Cherrier, who is recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman Smith. Ranking Member Ernst and distinguished members of the Senate Agricultural Committee, on behalf of Central Iowa Power Cooperative, thank you for the opportunity to testify on renewable energy efforts. CIFCO is a non-for-profit non generation and transmission electric cooperative providing electricity to 13 member cooperatives stretching 300 miles across Iowa and, 50, and serving 58 counties. 
Our sources of energy have significantly changed in the last decade. In 2019, power needs were primarily met through coal at 60% and nuclear at 30%. Wind was less than 5%. 2020 has continued asset diversification caused a significant drop in coal usage to 21%, while wind grew to 32%. Our nuclear plant also ceased operations. Our current portfolio consists of wind, solar, hydro, landfill gas, natural gas, and coal. 2021 projections show our renewable energy at over 40%. Many of the renewable energy credits with these projects have been sold into the renewable market. By 2030, we project our portfolio to be over 60% wind and solar. <clears throat> However, intermittent resources like wind and solar cannot support the growing demand for power alone. Diverse generation capacity, including coal, natural gas, and nuclear, is necessary to provide power. Excuse me. <laughs> Did we lose However, our intermittent resources like wind, solar, and and cannot provide a growing demand for power alone. Diverse capacity, including coal and natural gas, is necessary for power demand. For this reason, CIPCO invested $85 million to add efficient, efficient natural gas engines to serve the higher de energy demand. This enhances the addition of additional and intermittent reno renewable resources while maintaining service reliability. As renewable policy uh, is the is continued in discussions, we must recognize the need for a realistic transition plan and time period for accounting for the regional differences in resource ability. It's important for policymakers to note that the current federal tax credit structure prevents electric cooperatives like SIPCO from taking advantage of tax benefits to directly build and own wind and solar assets. The current program requires cooperatives to work with third party providers on long-term contracts to bring this energy into the market. The current incentive structure impedes our ability to adopt renewables and new technologies in a more cost-effective way. If Congress would recognize this and make existing tax credits direct pay eligible for electric cooperatives, you would see an accelerated adoption of renewables among electric cooperatives as a result. Most recent, most relevant to this committee, is our interest in providing rural utility service with the ability to allow electric cooperatives across the country to refinance interest on existing RUS loans. SIPCO has partnered with RUS from, on project financing from the beginning with an RUS loan of $3 million in 1947. Over the last 30 years, RUS has supported SIPCO with more than $500 million in secure to long-term financing. Passage of the Flexible Financing for Rural America Act will allow electric cooperatives to refinance the interest on existing RUS loans similar to commercial loans. Electric cooperatives would save over $10 billion in interest across the life of the loans. And for SIPCO, that number would be more than $21 million. We value our relationship with the RUS and an efficient system that understands the values of changing the utility industry is important for continued success are also relevant in the jurisdiction is USDA's development of broadband programs, which are essential to rural communities we serve. The Rural Economic Development and Loan and Grant Program is a key asset for rural growth. In 2020, SIPCO has secured $8.7 million for 10 projects to support rural businesses. Additionally, the grant and loan programs provided an enhanced broadband capabilities across rural areas, and that's greatly appreciated. Nearly 200 electric cooperatives in 39 states are engaged in providing broadband where it makes sense. Our own member, Maquoketa Valley Electric Cooperative, has alone invested $65 million in rural broadband in four counties. We appreciate the opportunity to visit with you with the electric industry and this committee's work on ensuring programs are available to support the safety, reliability, and cost effectiveness of the system. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairier. And we will now have an opportunity to hear from our last witness, Mr. Mancuso. Um, thank you, Chairwoman Smith, uh, Ranking Member Ernst, and the whole Senate Ag Committee. Uh, for inviting Iowa Western 
uh, to discuss the programming that we have here and the positive workforce impacts our graduates have um, on the economy. The uh, mission of the college is meeting educational needs and improving the quality of life through programs, partnerships, and communities. And we believe this renewable energy is a premier program that does that. Uh, the renewable energy is one of the fastest growing industries in our area. And we believe that we at Iowa Western play an integ integral role in developing uh, the educated workforce to make that happen. So I'm excited to share the programming that we have today. So a little bit about Iowa Western. Iowa Western is the sole provider of higher, higher education in Southwest Iowa. It serves seven rural counties uh, which equates to about 169,000 in population. The largest city is Council Bluffs, which is a part of the Omaha and Omaha, Nebraska MSA. So we may, about two thirds of our population are rural population. Um, and the renewable energy program helps serve those, those rural populations. Iowa Western first offered its first renewable energy program in 2009. Since then, it's been through two major redevelopments. This is obviously to stay current with the workforce needs and the renewable energy is an ever-changing field, even for how young it is. Um, the current curriculum that we have, we believe is a premier program for renewable energy, um, at least for our region. Iowa, off, Iowa Western offers a uh, renewable energy AAS degree, uh, a wind turbine technician, and a solar install certificate. These programs offer work, or these programs work in alignment uh, with each other to provide multiple pathway options for students in the renewable energy field. This purposeful alignment allows for students to enter and exit the workforce and, re and return for further education easily. This flexibility is key to today's workforce. Um, the renewable energy a AES degree is a mixture. The students get both the wind turbine technician uh, training, and they also get a solar installation training. So they get both of them. Uh, the wind turbine technician is a two semester program. Uh, this is basically just the first year of the AES degree. And students after that are able to climb and inspect exterior of the physical integrity of wind turbines. And they also are able to do routine maintenance. The solar certificate is only a six credit hour course, um, or excuse me, program. And they, this is a program that's also taken by electrical and HVAC students. Um, what I kind of talk about in the workforce area is that the solar is kind of feeding into other industries, and that's obviously a positive thing. So. Um, wind technicians workforce demand is really high and Iowa is expected to grow by 26.9 by 2025. Students who are seeking jobs as wind technicians and graduates from the wind turbine technician diploma or the AAS are quick, quickly hired. Um, on a weekly basis, these uh, notices from, come from companies for hiring opportunities. The majority of the students in the career fair field and the career field that in wind energy uh, go back to rural Iowa to work. Other students start their careers in Iowa, South Dakota, and Minnesota, and we find that a large majority of them do come back to their local communities that they grew up in. After a few years, many students um, have come back to where they uh, originally are from. Solar energy is relatively new for the Midwest and the Iowa, but it is the largest growing. It's Jobs have increased by 268% in the last decade in Iowa, and students graduating with a solar install um, usually have to work as an electrician, um, but also just recently with the large commercial solar fields, the, these large construction companies who are building these are actually um, hiring our students at great rates. We, we get requests from them off, often as well. So we expect that to grow very much in the future. So in closing, Iowa Western is interested in continuing to support and enhance renewable energy in rural communities through our renewable energy program. Iowa Western is committed to the success of the renewable energy industry 
by preparing educated students uh, to meet the workforce demand of the day. These students are passionate about renewable energy and many are interested in living in local rural communities. I thank you for everything you do for renewable energy in rural America, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists, and we'll now begin um, a, a session of five-minute questions amongst the members. And um, I will start with a question for Chair Sieben. Um, Chair Sieben, can you talk to us about the need for collaboration and coordination between the federal government and local governments um, and on-the-ground experts as we really want to reach our clean energy goals? And can you particularly address how renewable electricity is benefiting Minnesota's rural communities and how Minnesota provides a model for ensuring that local workers are benefiting from this opportunity? Thank you for the question, Chair Smith. I'm happy to try to answer that question. In Minnesota, um, as I mentioned in my uh, opening remarks, the legislature directed uh, the commission to look at the socioeconomic benefits of new sources of generation. And so the commission has asked utilities um, to report on the number of local jobs that are created in new construction projects. So we've seen construction projects that in Minnesota occur that prior to this um, request for reporting, less than 20% of licensed plates of workers were from Minnesota. And now that the commission is asking utilities um, to report on job creation uh, quarterly, we're seeing renewable energy projects employ 60 to 70 percent of workers that live within a 150 mile radius. So as I said, just because we're asking these questions, the utilities of course are, are reporting on it and I think they're sensing the um, investment that comes when they build new renewable um, projects in rural Minnesota that the community is more supportive of those mm -hmm. projects because the tax benefits flow to the schools, um, to local, um, other local units of government, uh, to farmers. And so it really, I think, um, is a model for asking these tough questions of uh, utilities and developers to ensure that local communities see the benefit. And then the second point that I'd like to make is that um, although it's not required um, by statute in Minnesota to pay prevailing wages, if there are any efforts that the Congress can take to level the playing field so that all jobs that are created in rural communities around renewable energy pay a prevailing wage, that will benefit local communities and local families even more. Thank you so much, Chair Sieben. Um, Ms. Score, I'd like to turn to you with a question. I really um, appreciated your comments about how biofuels and um, renewable electricity can work hand in hand. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about your perspective on how a federal low carbon fuel standard um, would allow biofuel power vehicles and electric cars, electric vehicles to work together. I mean, how could these two strategies um, be synced up uh, to benefit renewable fuels like we produce so expertly in Minnesota and Iowa? Thank you, Senator, and I appreciate the question and your support. Um, many, many people agree that there is no path toward our clean energy future without using every tool in the toolbox. And so we are well aware that electric vehicles are an important solution, so are biofuels. And so uh, it's important that we continue to recognize the innovation that's taking place in the biofuel industry. Uh, and with respect to any forward leaning carbon policy, uh, most important is that you get the details right. There are a lot of different ways that you can account for the life cycle of the ethanol industry. Many of them actually disadvantage the ethanol industry. So important for us is that you have modeling that reflects the most current science and reflects all of the innovation that's taking place, not only at the plant, but also on the field. And so we would support 
uh, the concept of a low carbon fuel standard, provided that you're technology neutral, provided that you don't have your thumb on the scale for one technology over another, over the other. We need to evaluate all of the options on the table. All are going to be needed to, uh, to deliver against our uh, important progressive climate goals. And so we look forward to being a constructive partner. We look forward to having uh, constructive dialogue in that regard. And we know that we are going to be used along with electrification and other technologies to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that answer. And I agree with you completely on the need to be technology neutral. That is a feature of the clean electricity standard in another sector that I'm working on. It seems to me that our strategy should be to sync up um, our renewable fuels efforts and the efforts to electrify transportation to maximize the job opportunities um, uh, that, and that we want to see in rural communities as well as maximizing um, our goals around cutting greenhouse gas emissions. So thank you so much and I turn now to Senator Ernst. Great, thank you Madam Chair. And the first question will go to Mr. Cherrier. And I came to the Senate just over six years ago, committed to cutting pork and working to remove unnecessary and burdensome regulations imposed on our farmers and rural economies. And I remain absolutely committed to that cause. Mr. Cherrier, in your testimony, you mentioned the important role renewables play in SIPCO's generation portfolio. You also mentioned that system reliability depends upon the ability to back up intermittent wind and solar power with firm, flexible, and dispatchable capacity like coal and natural gas. Earlier this year, as part of the Biden administration's goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2050, current and former government officials released recommendations for how federal agencies can achieve this goal. This included developing plans for retiring fossil fuel burning power plants. Can you talk about the importance of ensuring that any plans to retire any base load capacity needs to be done thoughtfully through incentives and not through overly burdensome regulation that could result in stranded assets and risk electric co-ops ability to continue providing reliable, affordable energy to rural communities across the country? Uh, thank you, Senator Ernst. Uh, I'll, I'd like to say that uh, we've made tremendous progress um, with the use of incentives and allowing the economics and reliability to drive the generation decisions. That's been critical um, for the utilities. And we can see what the incentives have actually done with uh, SIPCO getting up to nearly 40% this year on renewables. And uh, we're already adding tremendous amounts of wind and solar in the next couple of years as a result of those incentives. Um, but we do need um, gas, coal, and uh, nuclear. We saw earlier this year in the polar vortex when uh, we had uh, several states that uh, were rolling blackouts and, and total blackouts when plants weren't available. So diverse generations critical. And uh, SIPCO and in the Midwest Independent System Operations, uh, fossil plants really brought the power there that we needed and did it economically. We saw gas prices go through, um, go very, very high and all the coal plants that were available were running. So that is a critical element of this. Um, we've seen um, some of the comments on keeping it affordable. So using the transition with incentives is by far the best way to do it and allowing the utilities to actually make the economic and reliability decisions and we're already seeing fossil plants, um, many, many coal plants being shuttered and closed um, simply because the economics are driving it. And uh, we're, we're seeing a major transition in this country. Um, the incentives, and uh, we've seen the, the cost of renewables come down considerably, but the incentives will drive it that much quicker. Very good. Thank you so much. And Mr. Mankiw, so um, partnerships are really important in rural America. And could you please talk generally about how wind developers in Iowa partner with farmers and other landowners on the siting of wind farms and how this can serve as an additional revenue source for our agriculture producers? Sure, thank you, Senator Ernst. Um, 
Actually, in my written testimony, I mentioned around in 2020, there was $30 million uh, that were given to land leases for the wind turbines just in Iowa. Now that's going to supposed to grow uh, to over 45 million in the next few years. So these farmers can um, obviously have less financial stress and these farmers can more then more efficiently farm their land. Um, what I mean by that is that they can purchase new and more modern equipment and then obviously not have that financial burden um, because of those land leases that those wind turbines have. So um, obviously the right now it's a very precarious time for farmers and ranchers with the recent volatile markets and I know the individuals who have land leases for the wind turbines have kind of weathered that storm a little better than let's say individuals who have not or farmers who have not. So, um, so lease payments can be uh, kind of differing in cost or and then the amounts that you receive but even the, if you have four or five on a wind turbines on your land, it will be very beneficial for, for a farmer. So. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And in one of my 99 county tours in Iowa, uh, in northwest Iowa, very sparsely populated, uh, it was brought to my attention that the uh, wind turbines on a number of these properties, actually the taxes drawn from those wind turbines enabled that very small rural school district to remain in place. Um, that's one thing as well. Uh, just one of those secondary and tertiary benefits of having these wind tur turbines in our most rural areas. Um, a lot of our school districts face declining enrollment and the added benefit of those dollars in the, in the community is very, very helpful. So um, thank you to the witnesses. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, I believe next we have uh, Senator Klobuchar, who is participating uh, virtually for five minutes of questioning. Well, thank you very much to my colleague, Senator Smith, uh, for your leadership of this subcommittee and also for having the wisdom to put so many Minnesotans on the panel. Um, um, I, I'll start out with actually something, the uh, environmental benefits of biofuels, which I think it's overlooked and misunderstood a lot. And I'll ask this of you, um, Ms. Score. There was a recent study, of course, from Harvard. I consider that the University of Minnesota of the East um, uh, showing uh, the environmental benefits. Senator Thune and I introduced a bill uh, to direct the agency to update its modeling standards to reflect um, the latest science, and they're supposed to be updated. How would ensuring EPA is accurately accounting uh, for the emissions from ethanol and biodiesel incentivize higher blends? Senator, thank you for the question, and thank you for the bill, and we hope that this bill does become law. We have uh, ethanol plants today who are uh, producing cellulosic advanced biofuels, which have uh, significantly higher greenhouse gas reduction above the standard 46%. And they also bring additional value to the markets, which also always comes back to the farmer. However, these pathways um, are not approved uh, because uh, EPA is um, using not the right kind of modeling. And so it's very important when we look at how EPA evaluates any policy moving forward, whether it's the RFS uh, or whether it's looking at future co carbon policy, they have to use the most up-to-date science that is exactly. reflecting that is reflecting the innovations taking place in the plant and, and in the field as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's why I was so disappointed with some of the recent reports uh, that the administration is considering, and you know we don't know if it's true, exempting oil refineries from the RFS uh, obligations and lowering the amount of renewable fuel that must be blended. Um, I recently led a letter with uh, 14 leaders in Congress urging them to reject those actions. Uh, Mr. Schleck, can you briefly talk about the impact that exempting oil refiners um, from their RFS obligations would have in Minnesota and across the country? Thank you, Senator Bashar. Uh, the RFS is absolutely a critical, a critical standard um, for being highly impactful for supporting renewables renewable energy industry, as well as rural economies. Uh, as I look at our work with um, ethanol companies and biodiesel companies around the, the state, uh, the impact that it has on corn producers, as well as on the rural economies is, is absolutely that vital, vital infrastructure uh, that provides them the, the means to uh, 
uh, look at new innovation opportunities to remain resilient uh, as we continue going forward and look at adopting these new practices that, that meet new lower carbon uh, needs for consumers that are being demanded in the marketplace. Uh, so uh, it's an absolutely critical element. Uh, we highly support the, the RFS and our stakeholders as well uh, and appreciate the question. Thank you, Ms. Gore. Just quickly, is there any evidence that oil refiners are suffering from economic hardship right now as a result of the RFS? Absolutely not. There is no correlation to the price of complying with the RFS and refinery profits. This okay. is something that has been affirmed by many experts, including the EPA, several times. Okay. Um, one large barrier um, is the fact that we've got um, not enough biofuel infrastructure. There's been a lot of people trying to block that that want to stop biofuels from hitting the market in a big way. Um, Senator Ernst and I just introduced a bill to make permanent a USDA program uh, that has been successful in expanding market access for biofuels by installing new blender pumps. Um, I guess Ms. Gore, Mr. Schleck, one of you, how can investments in biofuel infrastructure help? Uh, Senator, thank you for the bill. We absolutely support this. We have seen with previous programs of investment through the USDA that those investments in infrastructure really help us have access to the markets. And we need consumers to be able to access these low carbon renewable fuels in all 50 states at every fueling station. We know that retailers need the incentive, the infrastructure support. So as we look, as Congress looks at investing in all types of clean energy, we've got to make sure that we are incentivizing the use of low carbon biofuels. Thank you. One last question to my friend, Ms. Sieben out there. Um, uh, rural wind energy, um, from your perspective in working with rural communities, how does expanding renewable energy generation capacity benefits to um, not just big entities, but um, small farms as well help? Thank you for the question, Senator Klobuchar. As we've seen in Minnesota, renewable energy, especially wind projects, have created tremendous economic development opportunities for small communities. We are seeing the impacts of increased hiring of local workers, which leads to more careers in the re renewable energy sector. We're also seeing uh, increased manufacturing uh, domestically of uh, wind turbines and solar panel components. Um, combined with the tax benefits that come from renewable energy projects, it really is a holistic, uh, helpful um, way to improve rural economies across Minnesota. As I said earlier, though, what we really need in Minnesota, especially, is more transmission. As of January, there are 533 projects, renewable energy projects primarily, waiting to connect in the MISO queue which total over 15 gigawatts of projects. So okay. once again, um, investment in, tra in transmission will, will really help our um, rural economies and connect these, um, these renewable energy projects. All right, well, thank you very much. And again, thank you, Senator Smith, for this great hearing. Thank you so much, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, next, we have Senator Fisher for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Senator Smith. I appreciate this hearing uh, today. I think it's extremely important. Um, Ms. Sieben, if I could have you follow up a little bit on your comments to Senator Klobuchar about the transmission infrastructure. I actually recently read from or heard from constituents about a large renewable project in Nebraska that is in jeopardy of failing um, because of the antiquated transmission infrastructure in that area. Uh, you mentioned uh, these projects do come with direct and indirect jobs. There's revenue boosts for the county and also the schools. We see reduced emissions. And more importantly, we have a reliable energy source. So could you um, expound a little more about the relationship that we see uh, between these infrastructure um, projects with transmission lines and the renewable um, project development that we hope will, will be able to occur. Happy to, Senator Fisher, and thank you for the question. Um, as 
as many members know, our America's transmission grid is generally outdated and rather inefficient to support a modern economy. Many of the nation's transmission and distribution lines were constructed in the 1950s and 60s and have surpassed their 50-year life expectancy. Um, so we need to invest in transmission um, to bring these low-cost domestic sources of energy um, to consumers. It will help decrease bills overall. Any um, dollar invested in transmission is estimated to bring a two to three dollar return on that investment. Um, it will, failure to invest in more transmission will prevent economic development as you um, talked about, Senator. And, and really importantly, Failure to invest in more transmission is making the nation more vulnerable to grid outages yes. and um, national security threats. So the need for transmission is really um, is is really significant. It's estimated that there um, that renewable energy projects um, could be deployed at a rate two to three times more quickly if there was. Um, more transmission, uh, especially in the Midwest, but throughout Thank the country. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cherrier, uh, currently in Nebraska is the only state where every single home and business gets a, electricity from a consumer owned, not for profit utility. Nebraska has 121 municipalities, 30 public power districts, 10 electrical cooperatives, and zero investor owned utilities. So we have a very uh, unique system in the state of Nebraska. Um, I think it it also needs to be um, have special consideration in order for the systems that we have um, so they can be included in federal incentive programs. Um, the administration's focusing on clean energy. So how can we ensure that federal incentives or assistance programs for clean energy work for business models outside of the investor-owned utility providers? Well, thank you, Senator. And I think the um, best way is really allowing the uh, direct pay credits to be done. I think what you would find with uh, changing to direct pay credits for both uh, wind and solar would be a dramatic increase in uh, renewable projects in Nebraska. And uh, the Nebraska has great pride in being a public power state and with its cooperative and, and rural roots and uh, has done a phenomenal job with that. Um, but also the ability to have the new transmission lines. That's probably one of the biggest drawbacks from reducing carbon footprints is the lack of transmission. We have uh, hundreds of gigawatt, gigawatts of capacity in renewables that are awaiting um, new transmission that could be developed. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Score, I appreciated uh, your comments about uh, the EPA and being able to give industry and refineries uh, more consistent direction on blending expectations. Uh, with all the sea sign back and forth, it's really hard to have any kind of business model there. And I think it's causing a lot of uncertainty um, for every everyone. Um, give me a give me a 10 second uh, another answer on that to highlight why it's so important that we address that. You're absolutely right, Senator. We are at a critical point in the recovery, the economic recovery recovery of rural America. A big part of part of our future success, not only to recover lost demand, but to propel growth in our job opportunities moving forward is getting the RFS back on track. Thank you, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Senator Fisher. Uh, next, we will uh, have five minutes of questions from Senator Bennett from Colorado. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for hosting this incredibly important hearing. I, I know people in Colorado are going to be extremely happy that that you had it. So I appreciate it. Mr. Cherry, I appreciate you raising the importance of ensuring that electric cooperatives can access clean energy credits. As I'm sure you know from your time at Colorado Springs Utilities, the co-ops in Colorado are doing 
incredible work to transition to clean energy. And I believe we should support them. That's why I recently led an effort in the Finance Committee to secure an amendment to ensure electric co-ops, public power, and tribal governments have access to direct pay. Could you talk a little bit about how direct pay provisions would help accelerate our transition to clean energy and what, what specific clean energy projects you'd be able to advance if Congress allowed co-ops to access direct pay? Well, thank you, Senator Bennett, and I appreciate uh, you being a champion for this issue. Uh, the direct pay credits will actually accelerate the projects that are probably all in, already in planning for many of the utilities. It will reduce our cost by us being able to access those directly rather than using a tax paying entity that is also um, taking profits and, and providing it to investors. We reinvest that money into the system. So it's really critical and uh, you have some phenomenal utilities out there, Tri-State and other ones that have invested tremendously. And I think you will see a great acceleration because they will have more funds directly available to them to continue to do that. And we'll see uh, these renewable projects actually accelerating as a result. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you another question. You mentioned uh, in your testimony, the importance of affordable high-speed broadband. As you know, in Colorado, electric co-ops like the Delta Montrose Electric Association are doing incredibly impressive work to provide fast and affordable broadband, I mean, competitive with the rest of the world uh, to some of the most rural parts of our state. And I drew heavily on their example to write the Bridge Act, a bipartisan broadband bill I introduced last week with Senator King and Senator Portman. Our bill would help to deploy future-proof networks that meet much higher standards for speed, uh, latency, and reliability than what the federal government has typically accepted in the massive subsidies that we've historically given to uh, large telecom carriers instead of investing in communities like Delta Montrose and, and, and ones like you represent. Could you expand on the mention of broadband in your testimony? What would fast gigabit speed broadband mean for our ability to transition to renewable energy in the 21st century grid? Well, I think you're actually seeing broadband as the issue that we saw for rec rural electric co-ops 100 years ago. It is absolutely critical for the lifeblood and economic development of all our rural areas and being able to keep them up with the rest of the communities. They are behind on everything from healthcare, education, and everything else that they lack because of not having access to rural broadband. And we've seen efforts over the last year where uh, people have struggled with uh, educating at home and other things as a result of that. This would quickly accelerate and allow businesses to be more rural and remote and uh, uh, it greatly improve the economics for those businesses, the, uh, uh, all your uh, constituents in those areas too. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for that testimony. Mr. Mancuso, um, I want to thank you uh, for mentioning the importance of workforce development. That's another thing that we really need to focus on in rural America. I often think we're failing to prepare our kids to compete in the modern economy. And fortunately, that's not the case with wind energy in, in Colorado. Much like Iowa, we have a rapidly growing wind energy sector on the Eastern Plains. Last summer, I had the opportunity to see it in, in action at Northeastern Junior College in Sterling, Colorado. Over a decade ago, the college had the foresight to create a wind energy technology program to train students for 21st century clean energy jobs. And today they're being hired into high paying jobs even before they finish training. I, I just wonder, Mr. Mancuso, if you could give the committee a sense of what the next generation of high paying clean energy jobs are gonna, gonna look like. Are they gonna be related to, to wind and solar, or to storage, to batteries, buildings, the grid, which we've talked about this morning, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, thank you, Senator. Um, I make it easy, what I, how I would answer that is all of the above is where we're gonna see high paying jobs. So, you know, the grid development is going to be very key. And once infrastructure is invested, or once we invest in our infrastructure, we'll see those jobs um, take off. Now, one of the caveats is that I don't know of a lot of those programs that are out there right now for grid development. So we would have to uh, 
we as in the college would have to develop those programs. But you know, the solar, the winds, those those programs are now and those renewable energies are growing. So those are going to be in the near future, those those two for sure. And As I turn this back over to the chair, I just want to say we've heard a lot of rhetoric in the last few months about the importance of investing in, quote, traditional infrastructure. That just seems to me will completely ignore the needs of rural America, which desperately need us to invest in the 21st century grid, not 19th century infrastructure. And I hope we can come together in a bipartisan way to build the infrastructure that our our country will need in the 21st century. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. We turn now to Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my first question is uh, for Mr. Charrier. Uh, I come from a uh, Morning, state. I'm trying to turn this. I come from a state that has got um, a real mix of uh, different energy alternatives. It's a growing state for wind. Uh, a lot of solar going on. Of course, we've been heavily dependent on coal over the years. Uh, natural gas is up and coming. But one thing I've noticed in traveling through Indiana is that you'll get into certain counties uh, that actually have signs at the county line, uh, no wind energy. You know, I won't go over the reasons why, but you got an adjacent county that has pushed it. Uh, you've got another county that doesn't want it. Um, I'm a big believer that you've got to always defer to that local input. Uh, I'd like your opinion on in just how it's playing out in Indiana and that urge many times for us to do things from afar uh, to where we'd put our guidelines and policies in place, especially from here to the states. And sometimes state governments can be overbearing into their own counties. Uh, what is your uh, kind of viewpoint on how that should work and how do you see it trending uh, when you observe across the country? Well, local control is absolutely critical to the development of uh, renewables in, renewable, in uh, rural, rural areas. Uh, what we've seen is that, uh, as, as you've seen in Indiana, uh, many uh, rural areas are uh, setting up signs to debate what type of power. We've seen it for solar. We've seen it for um, wind now. The, I think the critical thing is to have a uniform set of processes that allows the landowners that want to be able to provide this, use this, um, and uh, develop, uh, whether it's wind or solar, it's absolutely critical to them. Um, and also being respectful of uh, joint landowners. But I think having a uniform set of rules throughout their, throughout the state is pretty critical because it's, it's on a county by county basis, it makes it very difficult to develop these projects that, that way. And then uh, clarify in terms of any uh, input from the federal government that would weigh in in some type of way to homogenize the process. Is that workable at all? I, I believe it is. Um, I think the federal government can provide various incentives within the state and uh, local levels to help provide and streamline these processes. Um, but I think it ought to be much encouraged. I think here in Iowa, we have had considerable wind development and we've had some resistance in certain counties where they've set up rules to um, slow down the development but they are looking for uniform processes and having, uh, being respectful of landowners or adjacent landowners when this is being developed is pretty key. Well, I would hope that that uniformity never comes from here and that uh, it is within the uh, domicile and prerogative of the state. Uh, my next question is for uh, Mr. Mancuso. Uh, Senator Bennett earlier talked about workforce development. Uh, Indiana is the uh, biggest manufacturing state per capita in the country. Wisconsin's very close. Uh, but for my observation, in running a business for 37 years prior to being here, there has been an issue not only with state departments of education, but especially high schools for not promoting or at least offering 
those options in terms of high demand, high wage jobs uh, that most of us need. A state like Indiana, I think, ships out twice as many four year degrees as we keep in state. Um, what is your observation in terms of what you're seeing uh, at the grassroots level? Uh, are high schools uh, getting back to teaching these critical life skills and especially uh, pushing uh, career and technical education pathways and minimally not stigmatizing uh, that as an option? Yes, thank you for the question, Senator. And I would say, yes, high schools are um, moving back to the career and technical programming that they have missed over the last um, few decades in the high schools. Um, a lot of times now, at least in Iowa and our neighboring state of Nebraska is what they're doing is they, they are partnering with community colleges, either through concurrent enrollment or through um, sharing lab space to give those students those career and technical um, classes that they were missing before. So a lot of our schools are rural. So we have four rural centers that students are able to attend and get those career and technical uh, classes. And high schools are slowly and surely moving towards that. I will point out that Iowa is the number one state for concurrent enrollment for high schools, high school students. So we do have a large uh, number of students in our centers each day from high schools going through a multitude of programs, both arts and sciences, transfer courses, and now more so in the last five years, the career and technical. Well, that's good to see. And I think that right mix of making sure, especially for parents, uh, probably the main stakeholders in the whole journey, along with their kids, uh, we need to make sure that we're not misguiding, that we're not stigmatizing, and that we give the full range of options and then put it into practice. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Braun. So, Senator Ernst, I think we have time. I think all of our senators who have wanted to ask questions have had a chance to ask questions. And so, um, if I think we could maybe do a, a quick round of second, a quick second round and try to wrap up in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so let me just um, start that second round, and I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Schlecht from um, AURI. Uh, Shannon, AURI, I think, brings a relentless focus on value add for agricultural products, especially renewables, as a way of creating opportunity in rural places. Could you just discuss with us briefly how Congress can uh, better incentivize value-add programs that help farmers um, in rural places, especially in renewables, but across the board. Very good. Th thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, so ARI is, is fully focused on value-added agriculture and what we can do to advance post-harvest opportunities for our crops, whether they be um, corn, soybeans, uh, and across the livestock sector. I think what, what we've seen as a roadmap for ethanol and biodiesel has been a, a huge success in terms of how we think about policies that incentivize uh, renewable energy and advancement in the value-added agriculture sector. Um, right, Looking at that financial incentive and, and providing that, that structure and framework uh, that provides a, a marketplace that then incents more clean energy investment, uh, getting investors to engage, and then the wealth just begins to, to flow into our rural economies. Uh, as we see that consistent in that 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 approach, which is the the importance of the integrity of the RFS right, for for our current situation, as well as looking at at new energy opportunities, uh, and of course infrastructure, which we've talked about as well through some questions, is is another critical piece uh, of advancing value added agricultural opportunities and incentivizing that infrastructure uh, investment and bringing parties together to solve some of those challenges uh, and create jobs and opportunities for for rural America. Uh, we we um, think a, a consistent um, yet a flexible approach uh, in some manners is is required, uh, right? In in terms of um, uh, timelines timelines to implement some of these these opportunities, as well as the ability to work with a broad uh, swath of of uh, value added participants from producers to cooperatives uh, to rural businesses, and how we can uh, work with each of them uh, where they bring the most value to to the value added opportunity. Uh, again, to really get that into the commercial marketplace, start creating wealth for our producers and for the rural economies. Thank you so much. I, I have learned a lot from AURI about 
um, how when you bring that kind of focus, and when you are also looking at the opportunities for value add from byproducts of processing like um, ethanol, for example, you can just continue to maximize the economic benefit. Um, Mr. Uh, Cherrier, I wanted to thank you for mentioning my bipartisan bill with Senator Hoven, the Flexible Financing for Rural America Act, and I really appreciate your support and NRECA's support of that legislation. We've had a chance to hear uh, about the importance of this and also the importance of direct pay. Um, I want to just uh, give you an opportunity to um, um, give us any further direction about what we need to be considering as we think about, as Senator, um, Senator Fisher pointed out, the um, uh, municipal, you know, the, the munis, nonprofit munis and co-ops who are in a completely different um, environment in, uh, than the large investor-owned utilities. Well, th thank you, Senator. And the, uh, the flexible financing of Merrill America program is absolutely uh, critical to um, allowing low cost expansion with the uh, uh, rural electric co-ops. The, the program allows you know, us to refinance at uh, current low interest rates, um, the same way the investor owns can do a uh, refinancing at any given time, depending on what interest rates are seeing. So it puts us in a more competitive position and allows us to do our mission more successfully. And it, it's always good to keep in mind that uh, we're a nonprofit. Whatever we save in there goes back into the system, goes back mm -hmm. into the new generation transmission and so on. Um, as far as the direct pay credits, we really anticipate that to be something that we can now develop the um, wind and solar projects on our own more cost effectively than we can with a taxable partner um, being involved in the mix. So I think we can do more sooner and on a, on a greater scale than we otherwise would be able to. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll turn to Senator Ernst for uh, um, any additional questions you have and any closing comments you'd like to make? Yes, thank you. I just have one final question, and uh, Mr. Cherrier, as you had noted in your testimony, RUS has been an important partner to SIPCO over the many decades, and as we continue to exercise oversight of USDA, um, but also as we begin discussions about what the next farm bill will look like, can you talk a little bit more about which programs under USDA rural development you believe are the most effective and which ones might need improvements as we work to advance different programs that are supporting our rural economic development while also being good stewards of our taxpayer dollars? Well, Senator Hurst, first of all, thank you for being such a supporter of rural development. It has been uh, critical to our success and our, the RUS electric program is the, at the foundation of everything we do. Um, a strong RUS makes uh, for a much more efficient system, keeps us well funded. Um, I think the areas uh, that we can look at are continued support of the um, Red Leg program, the Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant program. We've seen tremendous success there, and I think continuing on with that program will be uh, greatly uh, supporting rural development of business. Um, the other one that we had talked uh, somewhat on here is uh, broadband in rural America. Mm -hmm. It is really critical to uh, remote healthcare, agriculture, um, development and use of high-speed broadband for new ways of doing uh, ag agriculture and uh, education are all absolutely critical that we have broadband throughout the country. Um, that's accessible, and we, we've seen new maps that really show how unaccessible it is today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for being here today and, and sharing information that is so important to all of us uh, that reside and, and work in rural America. And Chairwoman Smith, thank you so much for the opportunity to share some thoughts about rural development today. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank all of our witnesses for providing your perspective today. And I also want to thank Senator Ernst for your partnership in planning the hearing today. And I look forward to continuing this work 
um, on future rural development and energy subcommittee hearings with you and, um, and the work that we can do together. I, I note as I think about the testimony that we heard today, the strong bipartisan threads across a range of issues, um, but really all reinforcing this integral connection between renewables and the strength of rural economies. We had a strong uh, discussion uh, uh, around the importance of infrastructure from transmission to broadband to blender pumps, the importance of flexibility, particularly for co-ops and munis, and the uh, value of incentives to drive the change that we're looking for and the opportunity that we're creating. Um, the importance of job training, which is gonna be so important, and keeping those job opportunities local. Um, also, I appreciate all the comments about highlighting the importance of uh, the RFS and the continued challenges of, uh, around uh, refinery waivers and limiting those. Um, and then last of all, the importance of listening to local leaders um, and following local leadership um, um, in all ways. Um, the record for this, mo this morning's hearing will remain open for five business days for members to submit additional questions or statements. With that, this hearing is adjourned.